everyone. Welcome to another episode of Diary of a Professional. It's Ashley. Lou here. And we have the lovely Dr. Nicole Peoples with us today. She's a physician in internal medicine who who focuses on functional medicine. And we'll be delving into sugar cravings with her. Um, But before we get into all of that, we love to get into our gratitudes. So um, we'll start off our gratitudes of the week and I'll start first. And I guess I'm just really grateful for, believe it or not, the holiday season coming up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, believe it or not, right around the corner. I am excited to be around family, um, having tons of food, connecting. I'm kind of ready for that time of year of just like being cozy and just spending time mm. with and friends yeah i'm kind of ready for that and i'm ready to kind of wrap up the year so that's what i'm pretty much grateful for and looking forward to as well so yeah. i love it you know as new yorkers hey <laughs> um we are here for the fall fashion i'm here to see you know personal style but um i would say for my moment of gratitude. Um, I am thankful for the friends that I make family. Like I already have a large family and, you know, we're pretty close and I am grateful for them too. They're amazing. But the ones that you might see, and it might not, you know, it could have been years and that has come up recently. I had to travel and it was just like, still feel at home with people that like you haven't seen and you know, I feel like I, I'm, I'm really getting over. I'm looking at people like, I remember when you were this little and you know, they call you fam and cousin and auntie. And I'm just like, you know, those, those connections haven't died. Um, and I, it, it just feels beautiful. So I was, I'm, I'm grateful for that. And tell us Dr. Peoples, what are you grateful for? This week. I'm so I'm grateful for that. I am grateful <laughs> that um you know I get to be with my kids, <laughs> rain <laughs> or shine, <laughs> worry or no worry, um, and that they you know are right in hands reach when they're in crisis that they have somebody to come to. <laughs> but I'm super grateful for my kids. So love it, and they know who to go to. They know who they can go to. So. Yeah, I mean. I thought it was something serious, but it's her, his older brother was picking on him. So it was a, it was just a. Oh, no, that's day. serious. That's serious business. <laughs> uh, well, you know, it is like. Yeah. So let's get into our topic. Dr. Peoples really, really focused on like sugar cravings, hormones, aging. And I really wanted us to get into sugar cravings because um, I think that's something we all battle with, whether we like to admit it or not. So, um, first and foremost, though, what made you decide to pursue functional medicine? Yeah. So, I mean, when I went into medical school, I went in with the idea that I was going to figure out how to keep people well. And you get Mm. in medical school and you realize that's not what they teach you. They teach you how to diagnose illness and then what pill or surgery can you give to address that issue. But I knew from the beginning that wasn't what I wanted to do. And, um, I didn't know, I didn't have a term for it. I didn't realize that there was a whole entire field of medicine that looked at root cause medicine. So basically Mm. what are the causes of illness? And so I, when I was in residency in medical school, they used to call me like the conference whore because I would like go to all these conferences on wellness, (laughs) nutrition and fitness. And, um, and so I was doing all of this holistic integrative work. And then I happened upon functional medicine and the whole premise of it is root cause. Like, so really looking at the reasons why we get sick or the reasons why we stay well, and then figuring out how do you address that on um, a lifestyle level, but also on a cellular level. So there's a lot of biochemistry in it, but it, the thing that I do is I like to take that hard science and translate um, it into simple lifestyle practical interventions. So that's what I do now. I love that. I will say before learning about you, I am someone in the medical field, like I've been here for like 12 years. I've actually never heard of functional medicine. Um, can you also give us like a breakdown on what sugar addiction is and like what we should know about it? Yeah. So, um, well, sugar addiction, it's interesting because 
you can think about it in two ways. The first way is the way that we all know it. It's kind of like what Ashley said. We all know, and we've all kind of experienced where you might say, I'm addicted to sugar, or I'm addicted to food. And it's almost sort of like a lay sort of laughable sort of thing. It's not really ever considered like a medical issue. And um, if you were to go to your doctor and say, can you treat me for sugar addiction? They would say, no. Um, but the great thing about functional medicine is, is that we really do look at like the cellular causes, the neurologic causes of addiction in general. So if you look at any of the fields of addiction, if you're talking about cocaine, alcohol, um, or if you're talking about um, cigarettes or sex or gambling, um, there is a neurobiological explanation for that. And it, there's a part of your brain that gets stimulated. We call that the reward system. Um, and so that neuropath, um, that neuropathway that gets stimulated with all addictions also gets stimulated with sugar. Mm. And that's the thing that most people don't realize. So when we talk about addiction, we're really talking about not just this sort of um, you know, willpower issue, right? It's not your willpower that's keeping you from being able to eat healthy foods. There's an actual biochemical explanation for it. And so when you think about it that way, then you, then you can address it that way. Mm -hmm. And you could say, well, I'm going to go ahead and like take a pill for it, but that's not the most effective way. Just like taking a pill for any of the other addictions don't work, right? You've got to do a little bit more than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then can you tell us, too, why it's important to remove gluten and dairy from our diet as well, compounding so with this? We'll back up a little bit um, about just how do you handle sugar addiction, um, yeah. and then I'll kind of back into, like, other foods that also may be problematic. So sugar in and of itself, and it doesn't matter the type of sugar. It can be refined sugar. It could be honey. It could be stevia. It can be any of these sugars. Um, that actually stimulate the brain um, to feel to, to release a chemical called dopamine, and your body gets this satisfaction. So it's like you know when you're stressed and you go for a cookie or you go for a piece of bread or some pasta, those comfort foods, right? They're called comfort foods for a reason. They actually release dopamine into your bloodstream, and you feel like a sense of calm and relax. Well, then that triggers the front part of your brain that is sort of your, um, well, it goes through your memory centers and then it goes to your front part of your brain, which is all about mm. apprehension. And so what happens is, is that your brain remembers the last time I felt stressed, the last time I was anxious, the last time I was sad, I ate a cookie and I got relaxation. So then your body goes back for it. And then you, and that's where these cravings come from, particularly like when people are saying, um, I'm a, I eat when I'm like my mood is bad or if I, I can't rem remember the term I'm trying to think of, but I hear it all the time where people are like, you know, I eat, I'm a stress eater. That's the word I was like. Yes. So a lot of the reasons why people are stress eaters is because of this cycle. It goes to your, the dopamine centers, it, it hits your memory centers, and then it hits the front of your brain. So that pathway gets triggered every single time. Now, what ends up happening is, is that there are other parts of your brain, not other parts of your body, not just your brain that gets affected by these sugar cravings. That's the addictive part. But then it also stimulates your hormonal system. So like your insulin and your ghrelin and your leptin. And these are hormones that tell you when you're hungry or when you're full. But it also affects your microbiome, which is the bacteria in your intestines. Right. And those bacteria in your intestines that like sugar, they also cause you to crave sugar. So mm. when, so it's this, all of these factors, it's your hormones, it's your neurons, it's your gut, all of these things play a role in this sugar addiction pathway. But there are other foods that also can affect particularly, um, well, two areas, your hormones and your gut. Um, and one of the big ones is gluten. So it doesn't matter what your condition is. I'm always telling people you really need to do a trial off of gluten because gluten really can cause something we, um, is known as leaky gut. And this is something that's been well studied um, by a very uh, popular scientist at Harvard who's looked at the impact of gluten on the intestinal lining and causing something called leaky gut. Now, leaky gut... Um, causes a bunch, a, a whole other cascade of things that we won't talk about now. But right. that that um, inflammation that's caused by gluten also can drive cravings. Um, there are other foods like dairy that also can cause inflammation and also can drive cravings. 
And so when I do a full sugar detox, I'm thinking about all of those things on a biochemical level, right? You don't have to think about it. I'm just saying, this is what you need to eat, but you can rest assured that I understand why I want you to eat those things. So the gluten, the dairy, and then also the sugar um, and some other nuances to the program that allow you to beat sugar cravings. So clearly there's that like, you know, emotional draw to the sugar. Yes. Um, what kind of, and I think it's also clear for people to understand um, when we say sugar, it's not just like the white, you know, sugar mm -hmm. or the brown sugar you find. Like, can you um, explain what kind of foods have sugars, what it does to our bodies and the side effects of all of that? Yeah. So that's, I'm so happy you brought that up because I sometimes forget to make that point, even though it's a huge point that's very misleading to people. And that when I talk about sugar, I'm not just talking about the, the table sugar. I'm talking about anything that breaks down into sugar in your body. So that would be things like pasta and bread and juice. I'm, you know, uh, I'm always trying to explain to people, juice is not a health food, right? It's not... <laughs> As much as people like to think, oh, when you get sick, I should have a big glass of orange juice. Absolutely not. It triggers your hormones, particularly your insulin, and that causes inflammation and, and um, makes it more difficult for you to your immune system to work. So, um, so there are many sources um, of sugar that are just naturally occurring. Um, but then there's also added sugar, right? And so 80% mm -hmm. of the foods in our grocery store have added sugar. So that's above and beyond what's naturally occurring in a food. And so one of the things that's really important is to think about all of the processed foods that you're getting. So like I always make this joke, like why do we need honey baked, you know, turkey? Why do we need or like honey ham? Or, you know what I mean? It's like, it's honey. It's like they put sugar in everything. And that's... By, that's by design. I mean, I don't want to get into mm -hmm. the, like, the politics of food science, but yeah. you know, for, for things to taste good, we add sugar. Our bodies like sugar. There's no doubt about it. Um, and that's for a protective mechanism. Another thing that I always uh, think about is, you know, before processed foods came around, sugar was really hard to get. Think of where you find sugar. Sugar cane, Right. You yes. have to eat through like it's tough. Right. You, you just can't get a big amount of sugar. If right. um, honeys come from bees, you could, you know, risk your life, you know, going into a beehive <laughs> to get honey. Right. Um, and then when it comes to fruit, even sweet fruits, like you can't eat that much fruit that would throw your hormones off. Right. Like you might right. be able to eat two oranges in a sitting, maybe three, but you have one glass of orange juice and that's like eight or nine oranges. So when you think about it, sugar is not is our bodies are are designed to crave sugar. The problem is, is that sugar isn't the problem. It's our access to sugar, how easily we can get to sugar. And so one of the, and you brought up this point, um, you didn't specifically ask the question about it, but about sort of this emotional part of eating. And um, part of one thing, one approach to that, I think that's oftentimes helpful is to reframe the way you look at the food in our society. So I really try to help people understand that everything that's edible isn't food, right? And when you, when you can reframe that, and well. understand what's not food and what actually is food, then it helps you kind of decipher. It kind of narrows the amount of things that you actually have access to in your mind, mm. right? So when I go someplace, I don't think that fruit roll-ups are food, right? So I'm not going to eat it for nourishment. Now, I may eat it every once in a while because I want a treat. I mean, right. maybe not a fruit roll-up, but it's not like a source of food, right? Even when we feed our kids, we give them snacks and candies and think these aren't foods. And I think a lot of times psychologically, we think they're foods. And so we give them to our family members. We eat it ourselves thinking that we're eating food. Let's be clear. It's not food. It's edible, but it's not food. So part of it is understanding that our environment is a, it's sort of a disease environment. The foods that we have access to, all the foods that are, we are presented with, aren't supposed to be eaten, not if you actually want to protect your body and your cells and, and prevent illness. Can I even mention just like, just the addiction to simple things like, for example, Starbucks. They became, <laughs> for example, Starbucks, and it's loaded with tons of sugar. There was a moment in time I'll have like, oh, I'll enjoy, what is it, a, a iced matcha latte? Mm-hmm. 
But then after a while, um, one of the baristas was like, add a vanilla bean powder to it. And of course, it just sends a rush to my body because it's just tons of sugar. And next thing you know, I'm like, oh, let me just add two scoops of that. So now every morning, that's my go-to drink. I'm having this <laughs> um, ice matcha latte with two cups of vanilla bean powder with oat milk. And now I'm at the point where I have to have it. And if I don't have it, I have such a bad headache. And or if mm-hmm. I'm in the middle of the day, if I don't have it as yet, I'm super drowsy. I'm it's difficult for me to function. I'm like already counting mm-hmm. on my panel. How many more patients do I have to see that day? Mm-hmm. And then I and then when I do after a while, when I start having um too much of it, then I'm getting stomach upset. But then in my mind, I'm like, no, 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 no. But I'm having this headache. I, I need to have it. So it was just like a vicious cycle. And it took me a while to like um bounce back and like get away from that craving in itself and just having just plain tea in the morning and everything. So I just want to ask you, what are some of the side effects of sugar cravings that I kind of mentioned or ha- missed or things like that? So, okay. So I'll answer that in two parts because that's a little tricky one. So, because you mentioned coffee and coffee in and of itself um, does have, um, it, it can cause withdrawals serious withdrawals, right? Like headaches, right? So your lack of coffee might have been the cause of your headaches. Um, But the, so the immediate side effects of sugar addiction can also cause headaches. That's one particular side effect. Um, It can also cause um, the same thing that you described, GI upset, that being either nausea or gas or bloating. Um, So there are, brain fog is another big one. Um, fatigue, you know, so that um, slump that you have, that, that's one of the most common ones is that whenever you have high amounts of sugar, it causes that hormone insulin to kind of go up and down. And that uh, rapid change in blood sugar can actually cause you to feel very drowsy, fatigued. It can cause cravings. Um, so you can have these immediate side effects. Um, but what I I want to bring up another point about something you said that I thought was so great um, is the fact that to you, when you were going in at that point, it hadn't dawned on you that any of these things could be causing a problem. Like, oh, it's just normal. It's a normal coffee. It's a normal tea. Everybody else around me is drinking coffee and tea. It can't possibly be the thing that's causing me problems. And so what I often see is I have people come to me and they'll say, I have all of these symptoms. I'm fatigued. I'm tired. I'm moody. I'm cranky. I'm hangry. They don't notice it's hangry. Mm. You know, all of these symptoms. um, And they don't associate it with food because they don't see themselves doing anything different than anyone else. And they, as a matter of fact, a lot of my clients will come to me and be like, I eat really healthy and not realizing because they don't understand the difference between edible food substances and food, that they don't understand that the foods that they're actually eating or the, thing, the, the things they're putting in their body are actually causing these symptoms. So I think that's super, super important. So the, the symptoms can run the gamut. But here's the other thing, and this is something that doesn't really stimulate as much appeal like these aren't the reasons really people come to me to do a sugar detox they're coming for your reasons like headache nausea i don't feel good i have brain fog i want to lose weight although that's that's a maybe a long-term one as well but really the long-term symptoms right so diabetes which is a main one um gut imbalances um which can cause all kinds of problems including autoimmune disease neurological diseases alzheimer's etc heart disease, stroke, hypertension. Um, So all of these chronic illnesses that are also impacted by high sugar intake and and not just food, it's not fat. You know, people often thought, oh, heart attacks are because of fat. No, it's because of sugar. Mm -hmm. You know, when you stimulate high um, insulin levels, whenever you eat lots of sugar, you get high insulin levels. Insulin is the fat storage hormone. So it causes you to gain weight. And it also causes you to build up plaque and inflammation in your arteries. So that leads to other chronic illnesses. So you have the acute symptoms, but the people who come to me because they're trying to improve their health, that's a totally different group of people. Those are the people who come and say, my mom had diabetes, my grandma had diabetes, and so I'm going to get diabetes. Is there anything that I can do, Dr. People, to prevent that? And I'm like, absolutely. We can absolutely reverse all of those diseases because they're not genetic based. They are influenced by genetics, but they're not determined by genetics. 
They're determined by lifestyle. So if we can get you off of sugar, if we can optimize the way you're eating, if we can change your craving, so you're no longer craving sweets and now you're craving healthier foods, then we can get your body in a position where you don't have to live with chronic illness and you can feel and age your best as you get older. I think it is super important, especially, you know, in our communities, whether, you know, because of the influences of our family foods, um, environments where there might be food deserts, you know, going to someone like you can definitely help them, you know, change the trajectory of their health and their family's health. Um, can you tell us more about your program, Cocaine and My Cookies? Yeah. So, um, it actually started back when you, you made a good tie there about how it impacts your family. So I actually created this program over a decade ago when I was teaching mm -hmm. this course at Stanford. And I started the course because I had had my first son and all of my family members would make fun of me. They'd be like, don't go to Nicole's house. She doesn't have any snacks. She doesn't even give her <laughs> juice. You know, my kids, you know, you mentioned how like the, the cultural pressures to eat a certain way are real. And even as a physician, I, you know, who uh, prides herself on being an expert on these topics, would find myself having arguments with my family members about why I would not give my kids certain foods. And so in my mind, I kept thinking to myself, would you give your kid cocaine? Mm. And would you, and, and that's where cocaine and my cookies came from. It was this idea that I understood that sugar was as addictive, eight times more addictive to cocaine than cocaine. Ah. Eight times more addictive to cocaine. I know that sounds strange. The difference, the reason people don't make the tie is because when you think about drugs of abuse, you think about the immediate side effects of uh, cocaine addiction. But think about um, the, the potential harm of sugar. Obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, um, death, right, from all of these chronic illnesses. So the side effects, the long-term side effects of sugar addiction are just as serious, if not more, than other drugs of abuse. So anyway, I, um, I created this program um, with that in mind. And so the program um, actually sat on the shelf for a very long time, and I'm just re-releasing it now um, mm -hmm. because I had gotten to a point where I was like, listen, the reason I created the program is because I felt like this is the perfect place for people to start. Number one, as an African-American who treats a lot of black women and men, I see the consequences, the long-term consequences of sugar addiction on our families, on our communities. And oftentimes when I would go and talk to people about changing their behavior, the first thing they would say is, well, I can't stop eating that. You know, like they felt powerless, powerless you know, to the impact of food. So I wanted to create a, a program that not only educated people on, on food, but also made it easy for them to beat sugar cravings so that they could easily transition into eating healthier. So it's like the perfect place to start because if you could get rid of your sugar cravings, then it's, then we could, we could start tackling some of these other things. But as long as you feel controlled by the food, it's hard for you to break that cycle. And so um, the program um, is a 21-day detox program. It's an online course. Um, it's been created so that it goes along with health coaching. So I have a health coach that works with you. So once you sign up for the program, um, everything is turnkey. The idea is, is that you can do this program um, you know, without having to think too hard. I tell you exactly what to eat, what not to eat, when to eat. I give, um, I set you up for success, how to plan your pantry, what foods to buy, when to buy them, how to restock your pantry. What do you do about friends and family who might get in the way? I mean, I tried to think of all the things that might come in, in your way. And so you get this online course that has videos from me, but then also you have three appointments with the health coach just to help tailor it. Um, so that you can, you know, tweak where you need to tweak. Um, and then it also comes with um, a welcome box that has a supplement protein powder in it um, that also gives you the nutrients that you need so that you are able to ensure that you're getting what you need while you're eating, while you're doing the program. And at the end of the program, um, you, it, there's also an added portion where you, it helps you identify food sensitivities. So other foods that might be that you might have addictions to that or just your body doesn't respond well, that may be causing symptoms. 
So every program that I create is never just about the one thing I say it's about. It's not just about sugar addiction. It's about really learning your body. It's about learning how to eat for your health. And it's right. about you really optimizing the way you feel. Um, because that's at the end of the day, that's what people really want. They come to me and they say, I want to feel better. And mm. so that's the ultimate goal. So can you provide some tips to people who do struggle with sugar cravings? Yeah. So um, the best tip I can give you is to avoid processed foods. Remember, I said that 80% of all foods in the grocery store have added sugar in them. And so it's really hard to beat sugar cravings if you are continuing to eat artificial or highly processed foods. Now, this gets a little complicated because people are like, well, what's a processed food, right? Um, right. Understanding that. But the simplest way I explain it is um, if it, it would either... Um, uh, came from a plant or it fed, uh, with, uh, it ate a plant, right? So it's either coming from the ground or something was eating it like an uh, animal, right? A chicken, a egg, I mean, a chicken, a, a fish or whatever is either eating it or it grew out of the ground as a plant. That would be your whole foods. Um, anything that is then transformed is processed, right? So if you think about it like this, if I get an apple, that's a plant. I eat the apple as is, pull it off the tree. It's still a plant. It's uh, still an apple. You cut it up. That's a fa that's a stage of processing. It's changing it a bit, but it's essentially still an apple. If I put it in a, um, a um, skillet and fry it up, it's still an apple, but we processed it a little bit more. We've added a little bit of oil. We may have added sugar to it, so it's more pro processed. When you get to something like an pop tart, an apple <laughs> pop tart, that is not an apple. Right, like or Fruit Loops. These are not fruits, right? You yes. know, so it, it's not as complicated as you think, right? But you know, but you kind of go through the process. Like, how many steps had to had did this thing have to do before it became something that was ready to be served to me? And so, by the time you get to an apple tart or Fruit Loops or something like that, you can pretty much devise that this didn't grow out of the ground, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't eating something out of the ground. So. You want it to be, uh, you want it to be a plant, not come from a plant, like not come from like mm. a plant. Um, so that would be my biggest thing. If you could start by, uh, I, I don't want to say eliminate, I would just start saying, pay attention. Just start paying attention to the foods that you're eating and start minimizing the amount of foods that are processed foods versus whole foods. Um, and then also the other thing I would say is be gentle with yourself. If you're going to do this without a program, then I wouldn't try to do it cold turkey because it can get very confusing. There are lots of little moving parts and you may not know exactly what to do. But what I say, if you're just going to like sort of gradually get into this, you want to just start by noticing, noticing the foods that you eat. Notice what happens if you don't get the food that you want in a meat. Like what happens in your body? Do you get tense? Do you get a headache? Do you get nausea? Start noticing those foods that may be contributing to it and then re remove those food for a time being, right? Um, so I, that's where I would start. And then from there, um, I would also just think about not what you're taking away, but what you're adding in. So just start thinking about adding in more whole foods, yeah. you know, eat more vegetables, I, I really focus on vegetables, not fruit, because oftentimes if I say fruits and vegetables, people will gravitate to the fruit and fruit has lots of sugar in it. So, um, so I always tell people focus on in the, on the vegetables. Um, but if you want something sweet, go for something like a fruit rather than a processed form of sweets. Um, so I think those are the best first starting, you know, if you're going to start somewhere, that's where I would start. For everyone who's looking to start and obviously, thankfully you provide different levels and you can tailor it where can they find information to start their detox journey? Yeah, so um, you can go to my website um, that we'll post because it's kind of, it's, it's, unfortunately, it's not really of easy. <laughs> um, but it's the, it's the blackwomensguide.com slash cocaine and my cookies and black is spelled B-L-K and then woman's has an A in it. So W-O-M-A-N-S um, guide, G-U-I-D-E dot com slash cocaine and my cookies. And that's spelled exactly the way those are spelled. So um, blackwomensguide.com slash cocaine and my cookies. Um, and if you just want to know more about me and the services that I provide, you can just find me at drnicolepeoples.com.
And that's dr nicole n i c o l e p e o p l e s dot com. Oh, and I should also mention yes. the best place to find me is on Instagram. That's like the only uh, Instagram and YouTube. I have a YouTube channel, so I okay. post there. And Instagram, you can find me there as well. I'm not really on Facebook that much or TikTok or any of those other platforms, not even LinkedIn. I, I know I probably should be on LinkedIn, but I really just like to talk to the people. Like, Yeah, you know, the people need you, honey. <laughs> trying, trying to get out there. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us today and just giving us this information and giving us those jewels. So everyone out there who's listening, we hope this was knowledgeable for you guys. Please reach out to Dr. Peoples, you know, as well in terms of detox journey, you know, and cocaine in my cookies. There's cocaine in my cookies. Look yeah. into that. <laughs> or even just the information, because it really all does start in the mind yes. and, you know, knowing what you need to know and kind of like once you have that thought, what's that expression like? You know, when ev whatever you start in the mind and then everything else follows kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, I think she is a wealth of information and we're so grateful that you were able to share with us and, and give us some of your time and expertise. Anytime. It's great being here. So we hope you guys enjoy this episode. Let us know your thoughts. Till next time, everyone. Bye.